Why do we want to use native plants in our garden? Number one is because they belong there. They will enjoy that soil, that whole environment that they have right there, whether it's the shade or the sun. The plants that you find growing and volunteering in your uh, garden are the ones that are going to do best there. And especially, it's nice that you don't have to use pesticides or herbicides, fertilizers even can poison our water system. Um, who needs that? That's, uh, that's the biggest reason to use the native plants. And they support our pollinators. And um, of course they, they uh, have bugs, but they've evolved not to suffer from these insects that are eating them. And you might say to yourself, I don't like bugs, but I bet you like birds. <laughs> and uh, without the bugs, you wouldn't have baby birds because they eat caterpillars mostly when they're little. So, uh, and, and the birds eat insects especially in the spring um, and they, they need the protein and the fat. So uh, think about the birds. If you don't like the bugs, think about the birds. Pond holly, I'm going to talk about three small trees, especially the Yao Pond holly, which is now like the, uh, many of the botanical gardens are illustrating that this is a good substitute for uh, boxwood. And you can see how the little leaf is. This is a native. It has no problems with disease or insect at all. And it's so hardy. I'll, I'll illustrate that with my pictures that come up. The other plant that I want to acquaint you with, if you don't already know, is Simplocus cinctoria. Common name is sweet leaf or horse sugar. And uh, it it can't be propagated in any way by man. The, if you have it on your hillside, you've got it, but you can't go and buy it in the nursery and you never will be able to buy it in the nursery. The best minds have been trying and the professors say, Linda, bring me some. But they know they have, to, I, I tell them you have to do it in the Petri dish in your laboratory, but people are trying and they haven't yet. But here is an example of the buds See the little knobs on the twigs? Well, you'll see later what those do. It, this is a spectacular, I wanna call it evergreen. You see what, I just picked this this afternoon. And um, it stays like this all year um, until it flowers in early spring. And then the leaves do fall off and the new leaves come. But throughout the entire winter, you have a tree that looks like this. And it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. And if someone could propagate this, they would be rich like the knockout rose guy. But, and people are trying, but nobody has done it yet. I'm all for native plants, but even Doug Tallamy says that if you have a ratio of 30 to 70, uh, you're, you're doing your part. Like 70% natives is okay. And uh, the first slide that you're going to see is not native. It's the privet that con constantly wants to come up. I, I try to get rid of the privet and, you know, and I don't let it go to seed and I cut it out, but it comes in from other people's yards. So I was trying to live with it peacefully and I, I play with my plants. I being an artist, uh, you'll see in the first slide what I did with um, a little, it was privet. Okay, this is my little lamb. And at Christmas time, I put a red Christmas ball for his nose and give him antlers. And then at New Year's, uh, I put a noisemaker in his mouth and he, and, and the neighborhood kids just love this, you know. Next slide. Okay, this is chokeberry, aronia. You see how these berries are still red? I cut this from my Thanksgiving arrangement. And uh, these, these berries have been on the aronia or the chokeberry, red chokeberry since uh, last summer. Uh, and then I cut these and they've been just in my laundry room since November, but they're still red. So this is really a good plant. And so I went outside and picked a branch 
but sometimes the berries last much longer, but they're all gone this year. But the buds are very red and pink right now. So is there's not a day in the year that this plant isn't just gorgeous. And you can see the uh, silver patina on the bark. And of course it blooms better when it has some, some sun. And it, it spreads by suckers. Uh, kind of, it, you'll, make a, you'll end up with a little grove um, of them. And that's, that's a good thing. Okay. okay, well, this is the backyard, and uh, you can see that I have gone ahead and used some of our <coughs> oriental azaleas in there, but uh, not much lawn. The hillside goes straight up, and when we moved into this house, there was nothing on that hill. It was just a, a slice of, you know, how they slice away the hill so they can build a house. That's what they had done, and this is the front that it slopes very steeply down to my creek which, uh, which uh, and there's uh, dogwood at the front, but everything is tipped, clipped pretty tightly. Okay, right in the center, that's the aronia, the chokeberry that I was telling you. Now in the spring, the flowers are like little apple blossoms. It, it's just the best plant. And you can see how it formed a little uh, grove there. And the plant that's next to the garage to the left is a viburnum that smells like peach pie. I uh, had picked a bunch of blooms one evening, put them in the garage because I was taking them to a meeting the next morning. And when I went into the garage, the entire garage smelled like peach pie. It was divine. So many viburnums though, they, and a lot of the leaves are different from another viburnum. So, and uh, these are all volunteers, the Coreopsis, the Crisconum green and gold. This, this plant doesn't like its feet wet, so, um, you know, if you can keep it rather dry, that's a good thing, but it will bloom um, for about nine months if it's happy where it is, and the little leaf is soft like a bunny's ear. It's a nice, nice plant. Next. Yeah, uh, many of our native plants do well in pots, and this is just an example. Uh, and especially bloodroot. I urge everybody, if you, I found this bloodroot in the corner um, next to the street, it was gonna be mowed down. So I dug it up and I put it in this shallow uh, pot and I put it under the front porch of my front door where when it bloomed, I could enjoy the blooms close up and personal and the wind and the rain didn't shatter it. You'll see in my painting, I've indicated how very fragile the flower is. When I mean, the flower can just be there for a day, if it's under strong rain and, or a lot of wind, it's very fragile. Um, anyway, leave it in the pot. And when it's finished blooming, move it away, you know, so it gets some sky under the trees where you might find it. And uh, the leaves, are very decorative and they can get as big as salad plates, but then eventually in late summer, they'll be gone too. This is Perfolia at Bellboard. It's uh, luckily this is growing up the hill behind the house. So we look up into the flowers. Next slide. These are just, this is deerberry. I thought it was gonna be blueberry, but it's deerberry. And it was about four feet high when we moved in about almost 40 years ago. And it's now maybe six, six feet high, hasn't gotten very big, but it blooms its head off because I do not do a thing. I don't, I do not do a thing. I don't water, I don't fertilize, I do nothing, nothing. And it just does this. And these were volunteers, so all, all of these were, I don't buy plants. I just let mother nature bring them to me by the birds or the other animals or they're in the seed bank in the ground or the rootstock in the ground. These are penstemon or beard tongue. Uh, oh, this is the front walk. Now, the tall, way too tall red things are cardinal flower. And in the foreground are uh, fringed loose dries. The cardinal flower looks like this. It, it looks like a little 
little plant tinged with red in your lawn because the seeds need light to germinate. So the, the place they're happiest germinating is the lawn. So every year I pull out about 30 um, cardinal flower from my lawn. They don't usually, I mean, the, the books won't say that they get this big, but they do. And this is a bit much for the front walk and my husband complained. So um, we don't have as many of those there anymore. But uh, now we have deer and we don't have any red cardinal flower blooming. They eat everyone that tries to bloom. I still have the plants and hope springs eternal life. We'll get rid of the deer and then they will have a chance to shoot their blooms up. But the deer eat every bloom before it's six or seven inches high. Now you'll see over at the corner of the garage to the right, there's uh, elderberry and the little head of my little lamb that you saw, the privet. Neither of those are there now. <laughs> and the uh, I, somebody from Georgia Native Plant Society gave me some um, bottle brush buckeye, buckeyes and I put them in there and they grew. Okay. Well, I might mention, I mentioned the buckeye. So see the painting that's behind me here? here. That's the bottle brush buckeye and that I grew from seed very quickly, I have to say. Um, it just grows like topsy. And of course it's a wonderful native plant and there's the, there's the, uh, the red buckeye also. It doesn't get quite so big. But this gets about, hmm, I'll bet it's going to end up 10 by 10 if I let it. I, I keep pruning it back downward, you know, queen of the neighborhood when it blooms. And uh, this is life size. Here's a, a bare twig. See, that? that's, that's the size of the bloom, like that. And I found some dried uh, buckeyes. They're about this size. And this last year, I had a good crop of buckeyes, so I gave them to my neighbors. We're going to have this shrub all over the place. It's going to be great. Um, um, oh, this is, um, you can use all these things that you don't want to go to see. Use privet. Pick the privet. Don't, don't just pick your privet. Pick your neighbor's privet, too. And get, don't let anything go to see. And also the Nandina or Heavenly Bamboo. That uh, those berries are toxic to birds. Uh, they they really this was really confirmed a few years ago when a just massive group of cedar wax wings were found. All of them dead, and they went inside and they had eaten the Nandina berries. And that's just an assortment of wildflowers. Don't call them weeds. Wildflowers. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, this is uh, right behind the, immediately behind the house, the hill goes up and I find that I can get away with my wild stuff pretty well if I have obviously groomed bits here and there. You can see the, that's the Yalpon holly that I said is a good substitute for boxwood topiary right in the center of the picture there. Uh, I have several of those throughout my garden and that's what people notice. And then also having um, a distinct line be where, showing where your lawn ends and where your garden begins. That shows that someone's looking after the garden and it's intended to be the way it is. So there's Joe Pyweed um, to the left. That's the tallest part there. Uh, you can, like in June, start cutting back Joe Pieweed uh, at maybe the second swirl of leaves. They grow in a circle and each leaf will sprout another stem. So the Joe Pieweed will still bloom later in the summer. The blooms won't be as big as, you know, a dinner plate, but they'll still bloom and they'll baby, be maybe uh, three feet high and that's usable. Uh, this is in the front down by the creek. Anyway, here, these are all volunteers that I didn't pull up as weeds and plant camellias or anything like that. I'll, I have two camellias in the back because you got to have a camellia, right? But 
Uh, this is what Mother Nature does provide. And here we have mountain mint and goldenrod and um, Rebecca Lastinata, a lot of ageratum, white snake root, eupatorium. That's the tool shed that you see in the back and along this line driveway with these plantings. Now these people could have had any plant, any exotic plant from the entire world, but their gardeners chose to use native plants. I love them. <laughs> this is, so I had to take a picture of it. This is again, the uh, fringe loose stripe that I showed you the, this, this. It really is a great plant. It dies back at the end of the summer late summer, uh, but it immediately puts out a basil rosette. So through the winter, you do have this attractive purplish tinged basil rosette where you had these fantastic flowers and they're great, they're a great cut flower. You know, they don't close at night and they, they hold up quite well. Now they're, they're gone uh, having finished and that's Rebecca Lacinato without any, uh, cardinal flower. <laughs> and that's the same walk that's insignificant. There's ageratum. Uh, okay, about the deer. Now, Doug Callamy says that, of course, our invasives are the, the greatest threat to our native plants and therefore our pollinators. Um, but we wouldn't have uh, so much trouble with the invasives if the deer would uh, leave our natives alone and, you know, then the invasives have full reign. My neighbor around the corner had 25 deer in her backyard. I'm, I'm in the city limits of Atlanta. And 25 deer in your backyard is too much. That's a barnyard and it's not good. This, this little pathway going down the hill here was my little moss walk and the deer's hooves just dug it all up. And of course, I already told you what they do, eating all the blooms of everything. So I put out a sign, no entrance, <laughs> but it didn't, it, it was hanging on some fish line. They do say that if you string fishing line at different levels, the deer won't go through the fishing line because they can't see it. And if they can't see it, they won't try to jump over it. But um, they, they do lean against it, and it or they bite it and so nothing, nothing works. I still have the deer and uh, my husband made me take the side down, <laughs> no entry. And here's my little planter in the, uh, between the two garage doors. These are all uh, volunteers, native plants. Okay, I told you about Simplocus tinctoria. And I showed you what it looked like all winter long, but the younger ones especially turn this purple in late winter. Isn't that fantastic? Would you, would you pay $30 for that? <laughs> if you could find it in a nursery? I mean, it is really, really a great tree, but um, it's, it's not available unless you have it. Now here's a little baby Yalpon topiary can start them young. That's what I do with the topiary that used to have where my little lamb was and then the elderberry was and then I had buck, the uh, uh, bottle brush buckeye that got too big. So this is a topiary Yaupon Holly and I, I couldn't live without it. I have a little dove that I gave a halo to and it serves as an angel at the top of the tree. Show you, uh, here's a painting of Yao Pan with berries. And of course it gets the uh, precious little white flowers that hollies do also. I mean, Yao Pan holly, you, you can clip it back as much as you want and it, it doesn't even say ouch. Okay, the, these are chronological. Here we are on January 12th. And uh, the plant on the left is the Oriental Bittersweet, not a native, but I had to tell this story. There's um, a little 
I, I was painting it in the afternoon and I put it away to resume in the morning. And in the morning, two of my twigs had moved. Yes. Okay, see uh, like where the berries are over to the right. There, one of those twigs going off is a um, caterpillar. And another one looks just like it is a twig. And you can see to the left how the twigs position themselves at almost right angles, very stiff and straight off the main, um, the, the main vine. Well, <laughs> here's what happens. These little guys, they're about one inch long. And uh, during, during the night, they're going up and down looking for food. But as soon as it gets light, they position themselves to resemble one of those twigs with their little gripper feet. And they, they stick out straight and, and if you touch them, they do not respond because they are now a twig. Don't eat me, I'm a twig. Don't eat me, I'm a twig. And they are like that all day long. But then when it gets dark, off they go again. And for about two weeks, it was more fun to find out where my two little guys were. Every morning they were someplace else because they'd been foraging for food. Now, the plant on the right is, is a Smilax and um, Greenbrier, not everybody's favorite plant, but one year, the Southeastern Flower Show, we had a category you were to decorate, you'd sign up, and one of the eight trellises you would decorate for tea with a celebrity. And almost every designer had chosen Smilax because this was in early February, and it was the only thing they could find, I guess. It, uh, almost every trellis was bedecked with this Smilax. It's not Smilax, but this is, um, this plant right here is the bittersweet in bloom. But you don't want bittersweet to go rampant in your garden because it can be a nuisance. Here we have February 8th. Um, the beach, everybody's familiar with the beach and those pretty sort of pale pinkish leaves stay on through the winter time and the maple is blooming. Um, I have painted the beach three times. This same painting has the, I don't know, the beach blooms here. They're puffy little, little uh, encases of the fruit, actually, not the blooms. That's the fruit when the case is soft. Later on, of course, it hardens and they are the uh, beach nuts. And I'll show you a picture of that. The pine needles hanging from one of the parts of the beach tell us that uh, these plants are under the pine. Uh, here we have, and these all volunteered. There's a uh, heart leaf uh, in the background and that has little pink piggies. Those are the flowers. And when they open up, they're called uh, little brown jugs. And then in the front is one of the very first flowers to bloom is hepatica, round lobed hepatica. Now both of the leaves are similar. They're, they're almost like plastic flowers that you would buy you know, to bring in. They're almost like plastic because they're very durable. But the hepatica has red underneath and the heart leaf does not, you can see there. The, uh, when the little pink piggies open up, that when the flower opens up, they don't have petals, of course. Uh, and, and neither does the hepatica, actually. Those are um, sepals. So, uh, but there's a little insect. Uh, you, that's a, um, well, I have it written down someplace. One of, the, one of the very small bees. And he climbs in there and uh, takes care of pollination. Next slide. And we, we talked about the blood root, but you can see the petals on the ground. That indicates that uh, it's very fragile. And the ground clutter, whenever there is ground clutter, tells you what other trees that plant is uh, under. Okay, oh, there's the, okay. Uh, this is a sweet Betsy. I really don't call it, I just call it Sesaltillium, Trillium cuneatum, but some people call it sweet Betsy. And uh, the chrysogonum is down beneath it. And there's the samaras from the maple. So we know that these plants, those plants at least, are growing under maples. Now I bring in plants from my garden 
to paint indoors so that my shadows are stationary, not changing throughout the day. And, uh, you know, even some of the plants will follow the sun through the day. So they stay still if I bring them in and uh, the wind isn't blowing and all. And when I do that, I leave them in the pot just to see, you know, what will happen. So these two trillium came up for 16 years in, in a pretty blue ceramic pot. Just, you know, what is that? Eight, seven, they say eight inches and it never really looks like it's eight inches. But anyway, uh, for 16 years, at least one of them came up to bloom. And then the last year, they were doing fine all that time. But then the very last year, the 16th year, only one came up and the poor little thing was only about, you know, three or four inches high. And I thought, okay, you have that's Simplocus cinctoria. That's the one with the purple leaves. I showed you the tree, it turns purple in late winter. And this is what it looks like when it's blooming and these little buds that I showed you, that's what it does. And the, then the leaves fall off and new leaves are coming, but isn't that a spectacular, spectacular best kept secret? So it would be a tragedy if somebody had this in their garden and they pulled it up. Oh, I thought, I, I mean, I have about 50 of these, I think. They like my hill. And I thought, I'm going to make this a show place. So I started, it grows with sassafras, same spot as sassafras. I thought, I'm going to just make this a show place for this Simplocus tinctoria. And I was, I have lots and lots of trees. And I don't hardly ever cut anything, you know, but I was making room for these. And then I thought, stupid girl, you are probably killing them, you know, because underneath the ground, there's probably some sort of symbiotic relationship with the other trees. There's some reason why nobody can grow these and propagate them. So I have stopped. There is going to be survival of the fittest. And you can see these blooms, though. Now, Dr. Michael Durr included this in his manual of the identification of woody plants, which is in how many languages now and printings. But he said that it grows to about 28 feet and uh, that the fruits are brown, although he acknowledges he'd never seen it. So <laughs> I told him that I have 60 foot trees and I showed him in a slide we'll see later uh, that the fruits are Did I mention silky dogwood? The blueberries are silky dogwood. Now, silky dogwood likes its feet wet and the Department of Natural Resources are recommending silky dogwood as uh, erosion control. And that's exactly where mine were found with their, their you know, right by my creek. Uh, uh, and the blossoms are very much like the elderberry, but not as big, you know, like they're like little doilies, maybe four or five inches across. Elderberry does that so much better. But the thing about this tree is the blueberries, it's just covered with these blue berries. Just, and when they, at first the berries are all on stems that are pointing up, but then they get so big and heavy that they droop. But it's, it's really a great plant, the silky dogwood. And so I was picking up leaves and I didn't have my glasses on. I picked up this leaf and it felt a little different. And what it was, was the imperial moth right here. Now that big moths like that, most of them, and this is one, don't have mouth parts. So they only live for about a week anyway. But this one had fallen to his little kindly death right at my feet. And I said, thank you, my angels. Thank you. Yes, that's the jack of the pulpit and fruit now. And the, uh, the plant in the background is tipularia discolor. It's an orchid native, and I'll bet you have it in your woods. The leaf looks like this purple thing, one leaf per plant coming up from a little thing that looks like a water chestnut. It, it starts coming up like in September and it's bright green on the top and bright magenta underneath. And it stays there all through the winter. And I came across it and when it, it was snowing, it, there was snow on the ground and I noticed this bright magenta thing under there and I saw the leaves. So I keyed it out and it was this tipularia discolor, which I'd had for years, but had not seen the bloom because the, the 
blossoms are almost translucent and they're in mauve and uh, pink and uh, pale purple and they blend into the leaf clutter, clutter in August. And I was walking right through them and didn't realize I had them until I knew to look for them after keying out the leaf in the middle of winter time. I used to give a slide program for a real slides and I would show a close up of the very top of the orchids and the whole room would go, ooh. Then the second slide I would step back and you would see about what you'd see right there. Ah, oh, that's pretty. Then the next three slides I was stepping back until I'm standing upright looking straight down at it and you could not see the orchids at all. Now about, now about the jack in the pulpit, the fruits are usually found looking like this, all red. But I found one that had some immature berries. There was yellow and there was green and orange and I thought, well, that'll make a very interesting painting. So that's the way I painted it. And I stood back and it looked like a little collection of m and candies. And it was not typical of what you would normally find in the woods. And normally they all mature at the same rate. So I learned my lesson to really, really, really uh, know the plant ahead of time before I take artistic license and paint what I want. So. That's sort of like uh, the jack of the pulpits. The, uh, the female flowers are down at the bottom of the tube and the male flowers that are at the top, which would work really great, except that the male flowers mature and are finished before the female flowers have developed. So it requires an insect to visit it and pollinate. Um, this is partridge pea. Uh, you saw it in the landscaping slides. So I wanted to include the specific pollinator, which is the yellow cloudless sulfur, always found on this plant. This is one of the very first ones that I painted. And I put that butterfly in this jar and it would not sit still. It just was flutter, flutter, flutter. And he wasn't going to have his painted, picture painted at all. And I didn't have <clears throat> the heart to kill it for the sake of art. So I let him go, but I, had no, but I had no qualms about killing the red wasp, which is also always found on this plant. So about the second day I was painting this, uh, I found, hey, there are critters in here. And there were two caterpillars. One is green, right dead center, you can see, on a stem. And then sort of going up to the upper right, there's a yellow one that's feeding on the flowers. It was not until about 10 years after I'd painted this that I just, that I learned about this plant. I was at a uh, lecture all about caterpillars and the lecture, and he said the green ones feed on the stems and the yellow ones feed on the flowers. And I could hardly wait to get back to my painting to see if that's how I had observed them and painted them. And it was. So there's, there's no substitution for personal observation. If I see it on the plant, I know it's valid and I can go ahead and paint it. But it's a good thing to know what is typical first. Now, down on the bottom right, there's, I think it's called a sensitive plant sometimes, a very mini, mini, mini version of the partridge pea. I love the partridge pea. I have a friend in Virginia who considers it a weed. What? And she... Um, <laughs> but why not use it? I mean, it's fabulous. Next slide. This is the only painting, original painting that I sold and it was by mistake. I used to frame my prints in um, nice gold frames. And it was mostly to protect them, you know, and I, and I bought them by the hundreds and uh, so they were affordable. So I was painting, putting my prints and I was putting my originals in the same kind of frame. And it got mixed up at a Georgia Native Plant Society meeting and I sold an original and I have no idea where it is. But this is, but this is St. Andrew's Cross. A St. Andrew's Cross is not at right angles. It's more like a bow tie or a butterfly. I love this little plant. It maxes out at maybe mm, uh, 30 inches. It wouldn't get any bigger than 30 inches. And in in many places, it is evergreen. 
but the bark, even if it loses all its leaves, the bark is sort of like a manzanita of the West Coast. It's this reddish sort of shreddy, it's, it's just so attractive. And I love this plant. It's, it's just really sweet. Now there's a decumbent variety that I've shown on the left. I used to have that on my hillside as well. This shows up at the edge of dry woods, the uh, St. Andrew's cross. And it's durable. I mean, it if it's there, it'll come back the next year. Well, it never goes away, but you'll it'll give you flowers every year. Oh, I might mention about that. Uh, when I painted it, it was called a serum, such and such. I serum hyperchloroids. Then uh, the the great scientific minds did a DNA and decided it was a hypericum. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think hypericums have five petals and the St. Andrew's cross has four petals. Nonetheless, they're calling it a hypericum now. So I'm digging in my heels because they're going to come back and say, well, <laughs> we can call it a serum. I, I'm, I'm counting on that because it used to be a serum. This is, the, this is the cardinal flower with uh, the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. And we've, we've talked quite a bit about it. If you want to propagate this, there's many ways. The first way, I, when we first moved into our property, we had two of them down by the creek. The next year there was only one. And I thought, well, well, this is, I've got to do something drastic. So while it was blooming, I cut the stem off into six pieces, six inch pieces. And I put every one of the six inch pieces, I had about, Four. I put them in wet mud and they all rooted. Um, it might be because it was at the time that it was blooming. I don't know that now there's a better way to, well, in cutting the stem that of course kicks the basil rosette to send out more little plants around the edge. But the best way is to take that stem and weight it down contact on the ground and at every leaf node it'll send down roots. And then within a couple of months, you've got all these new plants. They're all in a row, but they're there and you can uh, dig them and put them where you want them. And then as I've already mentioned in the lawn, this is, this is what they look like in the lawn because they require light to germinate. The seed requires light to germinate. So lots of ways to propagate your cardinal flower. That's the uh, soapwort gentian that I said was also submerged in the flood. And it was about a month after the flood, I had a chance, I could focus on my garden. So it was about a month later. And there was the gentian blooming and I had painted it the way it was life size. But that year under all that rich mud, it loved it. And, and the blooms were almost twice the size that they normally are. They were like two, two, good, oh, two and a half inches. They were huge. They're usually not that big. Now it's pollinated by bumblebee and the books will say that the bumblebee crawls wedges in that way. But really another way that they do is they chew a hole at the base of the flower and they just go in their little back door there and uh, that's much easier. There's another uh, insect in there, the leaf hopper on the stem. Next slide. Uh, ironweed uh, is the rosy color, and chicory is the blue, and then we have the thistle. This was chosen by one of the banks in town. Uh, they had been sending out holiday cards with indigenous birds and and so they had decided it was time to switch and put native plants so they were told to come to Linda Fraser's house and pick one for their uh, holiday card that year and this is the one that they chose I I kept putting red berries in front of them and no 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 they loved the little blue dragonfly over there so I was very I knew that these three ladies that had come to my home were all going to get fired for picking something like this for a holiday card then I remembered that my Aunt May in the was along that 1860s to 1880s, ladies would send album cards in the middle of winter and they were of uh, bluebirds and apple blossoms, all things that would remind, they'd send them in the middle of winter to their friends and family. 
to assure them that spring will come. And so I told the bank about that and they printed that little bit of information on the back and that sort of made sense then to have this as their holiday card. Uh, there's a, a praying mantis, a little praying mantis up in the top right, peeking around a leaf. <laughs> uh, this is the little turtle head plant. You can see why it's named turtle head. And uh, I told you I have a phenology. And so along about September 8th, I looked in my journal to see where there would be a plant blooming for me to paint that day. And it just so happened it was across the street under the power lines. There's a spring over there. And so I, I scooted on over there and it wasn't quite time to paint the plant, but this little turtle was there. And so um, I came back the next day and still not time to paint the plant, but the little turtle didn't look like she had moved much. She was still pretty much right where she was. And so the third day I said, okay, I'm going to doctor you. So I took her home and I offered her things to eat that I figured she would eat, but she didn't eat anything. And um, then the next day she's feeling pretty good. And the next day she's feeling really good and she could really travel across the lawn and, and she's feeling so, it, what had happened, uh, the people across the street are afraid of snakes, etc., And so they don't want any vegetation, including turtle head, but no vegetation. And they even cut down fabulous native azaleas but anyway the uh all the poisons that they had put around was killing everything including this poor little thing and she had gotten herself cleaned out and now she's feeling good so i said well i'm gonna paint your picture so i put her up on my kitchen table on top of some boxes raised her up about this high and i said don't move <laughs> and i started painting her picture hold that pose chin up she not hold that pose, she, and she would move. Of course, where's she gonna go? Cause she's on top of a box. And uh, I, I'm convinced that she could see the turtle emerging on the paper. And when I was finished, um, I showed her her portrait. And then I took her outside to my side of the street where there were no poisons of any kind. And I let her go and I never saw her again. But no. here we have uh, the, Cut leaf coneflower, Rebecca Lastinata, uh, jewelweed, and uh, daughter is the white blossomed vine that's draped over everything. <clears throat> the thing about jewelweed is that it is um, included in calamine lotion. So if you know that you've touched poison ivy, or you've been stung by an insect or something, if you find the jewelweed, split it open, it's got a very juicy, sticky interior, and rub that on your ouch, and it'll make everything fine. It, it really does work. About the daughter, this, if you find daughter on your plants, you must pull out the entire plant. Here's what daughter does. It has a pretty little flower. It has no chlorophyll. So when it's blooming, it has these sucker feet that attaches to its host plant and that's how it gets its nourishment. And uh, then when the flower is, is spent, it goes to seed and the seeds drop to the ground. The next spring, the seeds sprout, they have roots and they continue to grow until they find a host plant, which often is jewelweed. And uh, when they find their their host plant, they dissolve their roots and they thereafter live quite fine on their host plant and they grow faster than kudzu. That is so all these little orange threads can cover a whole garden area in no time. It's uh, incredible. I wish somebody could find the cure for cancer in this plant. I mean, it's such a unique growth thing. It must be good for something, but it's not good for your garden. It's bad, unfortunately. So uh, the butterfly is the yellow cloudless sulfur. You know, butterflies like the yellow cloudless sulfur through the, they have different broods, but through the year, each brood is a little bit bigger than the brood before. And it's the same way with plants too. You know, you've got your, in the spring, you've got little plants and don't cut them back because if there are other things coming up 
and they're going to grow over those little plants and you don't see the brown uh, decaying plants but they're good for the insects so you've got the the second story of plants then when those plants are finished by then you should have your taller plants and here we have some really tall plants the uh, lacinata uh, and those will, that'll cover up everything else of course uh, there, there comes a time when you have to cut it all down and they they're advising don't cut everything if you can behind behind the shrubbery leave the stems of your goldenrod 12 to 15 inches high if you can they're hollow stems and the insects use those for overwintering so that's and leaf clutter too isn't all bad they i overwinter in leaf clutter too next slide uh, the ageratum, and what a trusted friend, you know, and uh, there's the woolly bear, and down at the very bottom at the right, there's a, a, a baby blue-tailed skink. <clears throat> well, I had an exhibit at Callaway Gardens. Uh, there were only about maybe a hundred paintings, but they had the stories next to them, and a lot of homeschoolers would visit this exhibit, and they would come in, and of course, this one particular day, it was about six little boys, and they were probably seven or eight years old, max. And uh, of course, they, they came in as a group, but then they, they didn't start in January and go chronologically. They just scattered every which way. And so this one little boy, he ended up, he went directly to this painting, and he read every word. And then he turned around and he said, hey, you guys, come here. And he told them the story about this little caterpillar. Now, on the very bottom pink, cluster of blooms to the right. There is a little half inch caterpillar and I found her going up and down every stem looking over every little flowerette till she found what she thought was the right one which probably correspond with the time that she had manufactured some more stickum because she would again pluck the flower put some stickum on it and poke it on her back. She thought she was Hannah Hopper. She was all covered with flowers when she was creating her cocoon, she has her own category of Latin designation. She's the camouflage looper. And uh, I didn't think anybody would believe my story when I was finished painting this. So I put the plant and the little caterpillar in a Ziploc bag up in the closet upstairs in my spectacular entomology collection and forgot about it. And then uh, the next year, my brother came, he's, a, he's now retired science teacher from California, came to Georgia to see an exhibit of mine at the University of Georgia. And uh, while we were at the house, he's the only one I would show my dead bugs to, you know, because they're crap. And uh, so I told him the story that I just told you, showed him the Ziploc bag, and then uh, went on to something else. And he said, Linda, Linda, you wait, you, you do realize now you have the moth. And in the Ziploc bag over the winter in the closet, she had morphed from her little cocoon in, in, and emerged as the prettiest seafoam green moth, only half an inch big, but seafoam green, not gray or beige like so many moths are. So now my Ziploc bag has a very dead little plant and uh, the remnants it still looks like the cocoon, all made of flowers and a very pretty little moth. This is field goldenrod, one of the many, 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 uh, and white snake root to the right, and uh, New York aster to the left. But I want to tell you about the most handsome bug in the world is the Alanthus moth. And the underbelly is just as decorative as the top. Oh, this is uh, just a picture of an exhibit of mine. This was in Gwinnett County. And, I hung about 160 painting chronologically, and many of them had the stories that go with it. I call that the uh, beginning of my book. <laughs> Don't hold your breath. But anyway, desk there. They, they also had many um, such displays of things from my collections. We had butterflies and moths and uh, plant specimens and all kinds of things, different nests. <laughs> they even made a um, artist's 
corner to show how I work. It was quite something. It was a really good exhibit. And a lot of homeschoolers came to visit this too. There, that's the uh, painting there. Well, I not only play with my plants, I play with my food. <laughs> and I, if I, if I don't have a cookie cutter for a leaf, I make one out of the rim of a tin can. And um, so I've got quite a collection of leaves. Uh, it's great for garden club meetings. I arrange them around a, a mirror. It looks like they're floating on a little pond or something. And there we have the mushroom, meringue mushrooms up on the top left. And I've been doing these leaf cookies for a long time. My, my sons are um, 53 and 56 years old. But when they were Cub Scouts to get their leaf identification badge, the, the Cubs, uh, first they had to identify, identify the leaf. It was a cookie, but they had to identify the leaf first and then they could have their cookie. But we've got beech and redbud and um, oaks, a couple of oaks and all kinds of things. That's probably the last slide. Let's see. Yes, that's the last slide. <laughs> Any questions? Well, the first thing is to look around in your neighborhood, you know, what's growing in the shade and, and what native and say, are we looking for ground huggers or shrubs or trees? But the, I would uh, first look in the neighborhood and see what people are using. That's, uh, and, you know, contact your university. Or you, I know you have a native plant society. I'll bet they have lists too. That's the thing. Virginia was one of the first to have a really vital native plant society. I go to Cullowhee Western Carolina University every year where I think we've been doing this for 30 years now. It's always the end part of July. And the, one of the first speakers was a gal from, she was the president of the Virginia Native Plant Society at that time. And we formed the Georgia Native Plant Society after them, you know. Anyway, we, I learned a lot from her, but I remember her saying, she was uh, speaking to the group. There were maybe 300 of us in the uh, auditorium. And she was saying, you know, here we all are native plant people and we are all lucky to be alive because aren't we the ones that are driving around the, down the road with one eye on the road and the other eye <laughs> seeing what's blooming on the side of the road. <laughs> thing to do. Oh, I've always got things in the work because, you know, sometimes I run out of, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm working on a plant and, and first thing you do is you, you paint the bloom because that's the one that's going to be gone first. And um, for, for instance, I have uh, Magnolia grandifolia um, seed pods. Oh, they are so pretty. They're pink and red and fuzzy and, and then I got busy and I, I haven't put the leaves in. So when the time comes around again, I hope to finish that. And there are several other paintings that I uh, haven't finished. I've got, and I've got a whole lot of boards with just insects that my little neighborhood friends bring me. I have a copper colored salamander. They're, um, couple of other frogs that are waiting <laughs> to be included in paintings, but you know, you have to paint them when you've got them. And so, um, did we talk about the poster? These are coastal plants. That's what they wanted, coastal plants. They gave me this huge long list. Well, most of them grow in Kentucky too, but they do grow down on the coast and uh, they, they wanted the plant and the pollinator, specific pollinator. 
So I, I designed something like this. I envisioned a mill floor, you know, uh, so this part had other plants and I was including plants that maybe nobody's heard of, but th that's, a, that's a shame because these plants need to be requested of nurseries. So nurseries will carry them and that would ensure that they don't get extinct. We've got a lot of plants that are going extinct and they're losing their um, habitat. They're getting plowed up and built on, you know. Then they got a new uh, person in that office. And uh, he said, no, no, no. We only want plants that are easily available through nurseries that people can go and buy. And I'm thinking, what good is that? But I did what he wanted. So, and he wanted the magnolia. So this takes up a lot of real estate on this poster, but uh, we put it in. And uh, the, the, you'll notice there are beetles. The, the magnolia is such a, a dinosaur of a plant that it evolved before butterflies. So it is pollinated by beetles, not butterflies. You'll see butterflies visiting it and they're after the nectar, but they're not participating in the uh, pollination at all. If you see a plant, um, building's going to be, if they're raising or they're going to plow down a wild area, take a look and see if there's anything you want. And then talk to the owner and ask if you can take it or the Native Plant Society probably does this too. And uh, I was doing it before we had the Native Plant Society. Um, I'll show you, this. by the way. Here's a, this is white mountain mint. <laughs> uh, I did, I did the drawing. But they have plant rescues. But anyway, you can tell the owner that you'll save some plants and he can put them back in the ground after he's built because the, the, that's the ground that those plants want. Uh, it's a good way to get plants. <laughs> Uh, there are only 16 prints that are on uh, my website. I know I, I need to do something about that because I have 83 now. But it's these, okay. it's these um, 16 paintings that are on the website. I, I speak to garden clubs and symposiums a lot, and I always put up a... Um, a full display of all my prints. You come to Atlanta, please come to my home right here. I love to have visitors come and I can tell my stories and talk native plants. And the only thing is there's the compulsory walk through the garden. <laughs> That's a good question. I started off with watercolor and uh, then Prismacolor sent me their entire product line, including the uh, square pastels and all the colored pencils. Colored pencils are for me. Because most of these that you see are colored pencil. And the, the trick is to work it, work it, work it, you know. Um, and people think they're not colored pencils, but they are. But I can get the, um, the detail it's just, I love colored pencils. Okay. I do. Not, water, well, not well. water soluble. I like the, the oil based, they're richer. Oh dear. Well, I have, you know, through experience, the only thing left in my garden that's blooming is deer resistant. <laughs> and mostly that's late summer, the ageratum and any, any kind of eupatorium. Uh, deer don't eat those at all. And they say that, you know, anything that's really perfumey that they don't eat, but they'll, they'll eat a little bit of it at least. They, they'll eat almost anything, but they don't uh, eat the ageratum and eupatoria. That's a good thing. The um, things that they do eat, you know, um, Donimus Americana, that's hearts are bursting with love. That's deer candy. 
That used to be a big problem on my hill. I was, that it's, it's really a eager beaver plant and it was everywhere. It was, it crawls, it comes up four feet away. And um, I was always cutting that away to make room for the other plants. And I don't have to do that anymore. The deer take care of that. So they're not all bad. <laughs> I, I've done like three workshops at the art museum in Highlands, North Carolina. But it was a long way to go. I was really wanted to do that because they do sell my prints at the, the Bascom. If you are in for a road trip um, in Highlands, North Carolina, it's a, the Bascom Art Museum is privately funded very well let's say and so the exhibits there are really good and it's free admission but they have a vast art center there for uh, pottery and painting and everything and they had me do some workshops but I, I haven't set up workshops I, I it seems like it's so boring wouldn't it be boring just to watch me paint and it's so slow and um I, I always feel like that's it I love that you include the insects. I think that is just a fabulous thing. Oh, good. Thank you. I really love that. I have to say the stories have evolved to um, be as much about the insects as anything else, you know, in the, in the painting. I have narratives there. When I sell the prints, I put the narrative in the plastic uh, container. So every, most every painting gets a narrative. Well, I was born to draw, you know. Yeah. I've, uh, I used to win my, my little way to summer camp with the poster contest and they finally disallowed me to enter the, uh, I don't think I'm any more talented. I just worked really hard. You know, I, I gave it a lot of thought and, yeah. So, um, but I, I have been painting for a long time. Trees that I want. Yeah. This was so interesting. Really appreciate you doing this program for us. It was just I wonderful. I appreciate you asking. It's, and I haven't been able to give this program much lately. You can tell I love to talk about the native plants. But we love to listen, so. <laughs> we hope that you can come back and see us again. Thank you. Anytime. Anytime. Okay. We're all friends. Yes, I'd love to be there. <laughs> well, you come to our garden club meeting. It's the third Thursday. It's been my pleasure.